In the next four examples I will examine the clues and signs given in the pages of the Bible. I assume that you know this book quite well, and I agree that it's full of inaccuracies, contradictions, mindless violence, a truly awful, revengeful Hebrew God who deals out death at every opportunity, and stories, allegories and metaphors which are indistinguishable from science fiction. I can assure you that I would have abandoned this book many years ago if it wasn't for just one thing. It's prophecies. Virtually all the prophecies in the Bible have proved to be true. Here are a few. Nebuchadnezzar's statue. Five parts have happened. What are the chances that the six will? The life and death of Jesus, which was prophesied as far back as Genesis chapter 3. The fall of Jerusalem in 70 CE. The increase in knowledge in Daniel chapter 12. The absence of God in the 21st century. Even the subject of this video, the absence of obvious or objective evidence. The gap between the super rich and everyone else. Humans will destroy their own planet. The list goes on indefinitely. Are they clues to what is going on or not? The mathematical odds for there being extraterrestrial life must be as high as there are planets with supporting suns. Millions, possibly trillions. So why is there no scientific evidence? Is SETI looking in the wrong place and at the wrong time? Have other life forms already reached maturity and destroyed themselves just as it seems that we will do? Or is any form of life so rare that it could not occur elsewhere and we just happen to live in that 10 to the power of 90? Do other forms of life inhabit another dimension of space and time? Nobody knows the answers to these questions, but if you interpret the Bible in a certain way, you would have to accept the last option, that other forms of life inhabit another dimension of space and time. Extraterrestrials have come and gone, and they will also return. In Genesis chapters 1 to 6, we have angels, sons of God, Nephilim, the Holy Spirit, cherubim, talking animals, and God walking in the garden. In Revelation we have angels, one like a son of man, dragons, Satan, a lamb with seven horns, souls of the saints, falling stars, a woman clothed with the sun, and so on. So what is so extraterrestrial about angels, sons of God, the Holy Spirit, cherubim, and perhaps even Jesus? Well, pretty well everything, I'd say. None of these describe flesh and blood carbon-based humans, that's for sure. But they were coming and going, appearing and disappearing in the Bible stories as regular and as common as a pizza delivery service. In fact, the overall message of all these comings and goings is that humans fail to see the clues. We fail to realise the importance of Jesus until it was too late. And in the future, none of us will be around when all these extraterrestrials return, because by that time there will be hardly anything left on Earth, never mind humans. However, this argument has a basic problem. If we allow angels, sons of God, Jesus and so on, to become the Bible equivalent of extraterrestrials, then that would make the Bible no more than science fiction. Well, I am prepared to take that risk because of the prophecies. I don't expect everyone else to. Having read, studied and battled with the Bible all my life, I am fairly certain of one conclusion about this life-changing but very strange book. It keeps its truths very well hidden. Even its prophecies are hidden in the most unlikely places, and when not hidden are still open to a multitude of interpretations. 
With regard to extraterrestrials, I will mention just this one. In Genesis chapter 3 verse 24 we have these words. After he, that is God, drove the man out, he placed on the east side of the Garden of Eden cherubim and a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. The Garden of Eden is probably a metaphor for the earth or solar system. The cherubim and the flaming sword or anything you want them to be. But whatever they guard must be pretty important to need guarding. Such as extraterrestrial life or another time and space. And what is the way to the tree of life? Again, a multitude of interpretations but they are all pointless when you ask the question how did the writer of Genesis know all this some 3,000 years ago? Perhaps he or she didn't know it in the sense of understanding it, but wrote it anyway. This happens many times in the Bible and it's usually called divine inspiration or just inspiration. Virtually every writer that contributed a book or chapter to this book will have written at least one prophecy or parable which they didn't really understand themselves. You have written many books and articles so you should know how difficult this is to do and still make sense. Some would say it's impossible without help from another person or source of information. It is an ongoing puzzle for thousands of people as to why the Bible is so full of inaccuracies and contradictions and yet can hit the nail on the head so many times. Here are just three and they all have a slightly scientific angle. Science predicts many different scenarios for the end of life on earth. The Bible makes its own predictions and is very detailed in many places. It appears to prefer the heat death theory. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar, the elements will be destroyed by fire, and the earth and everything in it will be laid bare. Why do prophecy and science agree that the world has an end, whatever that end might be? And why is the most commonly accepted theory the death of the sun, with its associated massive generation of heat, as it starts to turn into a red giant? Is this another example of prophecy coming true, even though everyone listening to this video will be quite dead when it all happens? Oh, and by the way, the Bible seems to know all about the demise of the sun as well. There will be no more night. They will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun, for the Lord God will give them light. Everything in the universe has been made from the dust and gases of interplanetary stars and planets which have ceased to exist millions of years ago. After many more millions of years, whatever has been made will also return to dust and gases. Is there anything controlling the uncontrollable and how does a 3,000 year old book already know about this problem? And the third and last example, most scientists will agree that in spite of the odds against life ever existing and the marvels of biology and the human brain, life is still very primitive. Why does the Bible admit as much? For the creation was subjected to frustration not by its own choice but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Am I just picking and choosing verses at random? Or are we in fact on a road with only one torch in the pitch black? And we have to trust the signs and clues which happen to be caught in that tiny light 